What's going on, everybody? Isaac here to tell you a story today. And it's a true story. And that makes it better, right? So, a few weeks back, I posted a video, I believe I titled it Crime Knives, because I had a thought. You, you hear about, like, a, a crime in the news or whatever, and you see that a knife was used. I wonder, I wonder what kind of knife they use. Like, do I have that knife that was used in this crime? Well, I'm here to tell you a story and show you pictures of two different knives that were used in real crimes that took place about this time of year in 1865. Now, one of the crimes, they're, they're related, but separate, separate incidents, took place in the same city, Washington, D.C., on the night of April 14th, 1865, a little after 10 o'clock p.m. So... Two incidents, but related in the fact it was an attempt to overthrow the government of the United States of America. So, about a week before this incident, on April 9th, 1865, General Robert E. Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia to General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. If you grew up in the United States, I'm sure you learned that in your history classes in school. We also know about a fella, an actor, by the name of John Wilkes Booth, assassinated President Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Now, we all know President Lincoln was shot. He was shot in, in the head with a small, you know, little, little pocket Derringer pistol and he died um, with, within a few hours. He was taken to a house across the street from the theater and died of his gunshot wound. Now, it was not the only incident of violence there at Ford's Theater. So John Wilkes Booth, while he had his pocket pistol, he also was armed with a dagger and it was used that night so, in the president's booth at the theater that night was a major, military rank major, Rathbone. Uh, he was there with his wife accompanying President Lincoln and his wife, Mary Todd, there at the play for some entertainment following a great victory of the Civil War. Now, Major Rathbone after hearing the shot that killed President Lincoln, he stood up and saw John Wilkes Booth standing at the door where he had fired the shot and stood up to confront Booth. But Booth pulled out his dagger, which you can see here. And he stabbed Major Rathbone in the forearm. Stabbed him or cut him, you know, something. So, there is a crime knife. Probably the most famous crime incident in the history of the United States of America. Take your pick. The Lincoln assassination or the JFK assassination. Whichever. It doesn't matter. But anyway, John Wilkes Booth cuts Major Rathbone's arm leaps down onto the stage, yells something. We don't really know for sure, although some say it was the Virginia State motto, Six Semper Tyrannus, thus always to tyrants. And he fled and was on the run for, I think about two weeks or so, till he was finally found and I believe burned alive in a barn in Maryland. Now, there's more to the story than just the shooting of President Lincoln. There was a whole conspiracy going on. A few guys met at the home of a Mary Surratt, 
and she had a son who was involved in the, this conspiracy, and he had some buddies, like John Wilkes Booth, who killed President Lincoln, a guy named George Azeroth, who was supposed to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson, who of course became the sitting president once Lincoln passed away. George didn't go through with the plan. He booked a room at the same hotel that President or then Vice President Andrew Johnson was staying. He booked the room directly above Andrew Johnson's. Can you imagine that? Nothing like that would ever happen today with the way the Secret Service works. Never in a million years could some Joe Schmo like me book a hotel room directly above the Vice President of the United States of America. But in 1865, no president had ever been assassinated before. But old George got to drinking at the hotel bar. Didn't go through with his plan. He started wandering around the streets of Washington, D.C. And eventually booked a room at another hotel and passed out, I guess. However, a couple other guys, uh, and actually I forget one of their names, but he showed the way to the home of the Secretary of State, William Seward, to a young man by the name of Lewis Powell, uh, who kind of went by an alias Lewis Payne um, to his co-conspirators. Uh, but his name was Lewis Powell. He was from Florida, lived uh, about halfway between uh, today's Jacksonville and Tallahassee, and he joined the Confederate Army, like many a young Southern man in the 1860s. Lewis Powell was wounded at the Battle of Gettysburg, and eventually made his way into Maryland as a prisoner of war and escaped because he was in a relationship with a girl who helped him out a bit, Lewis, Lewis Powell, handsome young man, you can see him here. Now, Lewis Powell escaped uh, from there, eventually made his way to uh, the area of Virginia where I live, and became a part of Mosby's Rangers, who were a partisan unit patrolling uh, Loudoun County and Fauquier County and uh, parts of the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, kind of uh, didn't have really a huge military impact, but were a big annoyance to the Federal Army in that area. Their biggest claim to fame, and I, I do not know if Lewis Powell was engaged in this, but they, they had an awesome raid on a supply line for General Phil Sheridan's army out in the Shenandoah Valley that really wrecked up that army's food for a few days. That that was their biggest military accomplishment. Now they have plenty of cool accomplishments for sure, but really didn't change the impact of the war all that much. So Lewis Powell, while he's part of Mosby's Rangers, he eventually gets involved in the Confederate Secret Service and eventually meets up with uh, John Wilkes Booth and uh, the Surratt fella and the other guys. And John Wilkes Booth, who was who was really, I guess, the mastermind of the the con conspiracy, he assigned Lewis Powell to take out the Secretary of State, William Seward. William Seward uh, would eventually get his claim to fame for Seward's folly a few years later with the purchase of Alaska. But right now, he's Secretary of State under Abraham Lincoln. And Lewis Powell has been assigned to assassinate him. Now, the Secretary of State is laid up in bed 
because he had a carriage accident um, several days before this, and his he, he broke his jaw. Now, Lewis Powell pretends to be sent from the pharmacy with uh, some medication prescribed by Secretary of State Seward's doctor. And Secretary of State's butler answers the door. Didn't really believe Lewis Powell about the prescriptions, but uh, Powell eventually makes his way into the house and is met on the staircase by William Seward's son, who is like an assistant to the Secretary of State. And he knows something's amiss. So Lewis Powell pulls out his revolver. Boom! But no boom. There was no boom. Because the revolver misfired. So Powell took the butt end of the gun and whapped Kid Seward over the head, rendering him unconscious. And he was in a coma for about two months after this because of that. So he hit him pretty darn hard. Then Seward's young daughter was in the Secretary of State's bedroom and she starts screaming. And she witnesses what is about to come. Lewis Powell whips out his Bowie knife. Seen here. And goes in and thrashes Secretary of State Stewart's face and neck. But since he broke his jaw in the carriage accident, there's a, a brace here. And Powell isn't exactly able to cut Seward's throat as he had planned. Some more folks show up on the defense of the Secretary of State, and Powell flees the scene, but not before cutting somebody else with that Bowie knife. Now, I think it's the next day, Powell shows up to the Surratt house with a pickaxe, and it's, it's late at night, like 11 o'clock at night or some nonsense. And he, he makes up some story because the police are there, or Secret Service or whoever is there, investigating this and questioning Mary Surratt. And Powell says some story. It's like, oh, I'm here to dig a gutter or something. But that didn't fly. I mean, it's 11 o'clock at night. You're not going to show up to do any work that late. So Powell... And the other conspirators, minus Booth, because he's on the run. The other guys got caught and eventually hung in Washington, D.C. True crime, true crime knives. Hope you enjoyed this bit of American history and saw a couple cool knives that did some vicious things.